so we're sitting in the kitchen in a family home. How does that sound to you when I say this is the family home? Um, I think I've stopped calling, referring to this as the family home. I think uh, my children need to learn that the home is much more than just bricks and mortar. I think that we have decided that we are going to call wherever we place our heads the family home from now onwards. Um, we don't have a specific abode and we need to nearly detach ourselves from the existing building. Um, so we've stopped referring to this, we call it the house from now onwards. Um, I suppose we are very much aware that wherever we are together will be our family home as such. In 2003, my father, God rest him, gave us a site. This house was built on his farm. Uh, he asked me to pick anywhere at all and that I could have a quarter of an a half an acre uh, to build the home of my dreams. And we jumped on that opportunity. We started getting plans together, eventually leading to builders. And in 2004, we moved into our home and we were absolutely thrilled. And it was absolutely beautiful. No expense was spared. We um, finished it completely apart from the garden. And I suppose we spent the next three, four years adding on, buying bits, every penny that came into the house went into the house. There was a, a lull in fashion at the time. I don't think I bought any new clothes for a number of years. Um, everything went into the house. It was getting the best of everything that we could. And we both worked really hard for this. And we feel that we really deserved it. Um, I suppose then, shortly on in 2008, I started questioning things. I could see cracks coming in the house. Uh, initially, we blamed the plaster. We dragged the plasterer back. We asked him what the problem was. Um, he couldn't understand what was happening, but we made the decision to pick off the plaster and re-plaster the side gable. Uh, he referred to the plaster as boast, meaning it was sitting out from the wall. But he um, was kind enough to replaster the wall. And I am guessing that within three years again, the cracking reappeared. And at this stage, Micah became a known factor in the area. So he, we decided that, you know, it must be something greater. And we started looking about trying to find out what exactly was wrong with the house. Now with memory, the plasterer said that he can remember replastering the house and plastering it. And he said it wasn't a particularly humid day, but he had never plastered a wall that took so much water that it was as if the blocks were sucking in the water as he was plastering the house from day go. So um, I suppose as time went on, we realized we had, I'm going to say the dreaded curse Micah in our home and that we knew there was very little we could do to actually stop it. We even tried test pots because we planned obviously to paint our house and we tried them towards the end of a summer and by the following summer they had cracked completely and it was clearly that it was too late for us to paint our house. If we painted it it seemed to put pressure on and caused the spider web cracking that Micah homeowners are very familiar with. So we've never got to paint our house and we never really got to finish our house. I would safely say that we've gone on through all the different stages of grief as a family together. So you start in denial, this is not happening, um, to blaming, to, you know, um, probably at stages you were saying, it's going to be okay, you know, we'll do A, B, C and D. At least we're still healthy. Uh, at least we're all still together. At least this, but at the end of the day, you get through all the stages of grief and we're a decade on here. I mean, I can talk about this now. If you had come to my kitchen 10 years ago, I don't think I'd have been able to talk about this at all. And I believe that that's why we need to talk because there's people finding out daily that their homes have got mica and that their only solution is demolition. We are now at the stage where we know our house has been condemned. 
We know our gable wall is going to fall in a number of years' time. We don't know how long we have, but we know what the eventuality is going to be. We've totally accepted that, and we just want to move on with our lives. We are ready to move on, and we just need a proper solution and a proper redress in, in place for us. I have three young children. We are paying a mortgage in this house. We are paying childcare. We are the pay, pay, pay middle group that just never seems to get a breath. And to be honest with you, when our house, where we're told that we have to leave our house, we're going to have to rent another home. Uh, that's not going to be easy in this area. We are also going to have to save. We have been saving for the rebuild. We know that what is being allowed is never going to build a house like this again. Um, so we are really caught. Uh, it's difficult enough to save a few pennies, but whenever you're talking about paying a mortgage, paying childcare, and on top of that paying rent, it's an impossibility. So I'm seeing this as a circle that we're going to have great difficulty to get out of. And this is from a two income family and we both work really hard. And, you know, to the rest of the world, um, you shouldn't have to pay twice for your home. All we want is what we originally paid for. What has kept you going in the midst of all of this? I think every mother will say what keeps you going is your children. Um, we have constantly painted a positive slight on this whole thing for the children. When my children are going to bed at night, sometimes they will ask, could the wall fall down, mummy? Is the crack in my bedroom getting larger? Is our house still safe? And obviously I instantly say, no darling, of course the wall is not gonna fall down. Of course our house is safe. I constantly reassure them, and I feel that it's very important that we paint this positive slant to our children. But when they go to bed at night, and I'm lying in my bed, I often hear the cracking, hear the bursting sounds, and I do wonder to myself, how much longer are we safe in this house? I mean, we're not psychologists, we're parents. We don't know how to guide our children through this. We are not getting any help or advice, and we really do need help with this. I ask the question now daily, knowing that my house is going to be demolished, should I let my children actually watch the house crumble to the ground? Is that going to bring them healing? Or is that going to scar them for life? I have yet to have anybody answer that question for me. And I think as parents, we really need help in taking our children on this journey with us. No child should have to endure this. And as parents, whenever our children have to endure things that they shouldn't have to, we take on their burden. And my advice is that we should talk about it. Our government used sneaky psychology, and I call it sneaky psychology because they ask us to pay. They tell us that we need to pay 10%, which is not really 10%, it's a heck of a lot more. But by that very thing, they have closed minds and they have closed hearts, and they've made people take on the blame of the defective blocks. We have nothing to be ashamed of. We are not to blame. We did absolutely nothing wrong. And I believe that it's only now that people are able to talk about it whenever they realize the injustice that the government has caused. But by asking us to pay 10%, our government is telling us that we are somehow to blame. And we must remind ourselves daily that we are not to blame in this. We bought our blocks in good faith. We bought our houses in good faith. And we deserve nothing less than 100% redress. I'm certainly not the only person in this community. If we sit down and draw a map of half a mile radius of where I live, and this is a very rural, rural area, you can count 20 other households. And that's the ones that we know of. I said earlier that I built on my father's farm. I had two other sisters that also built on their father's farm. Their houses also have to be demolished. So that's three sisters in one family. Where are we going to go? We do not know. We're aware of pensioners, people living um, 
on their pension, trying to manoeuvre their way through this scheme. We are aware of families with children with special needs that can't possibly find alternative accommodation because their accommodation that they have is so specific to the needs of their family. So their decision to whether they just continue to live in a crumbling house, which is damp, which is letting in the water, which is unsafe, is through no choice. They actually just have to stay with it. So our whole community is actually grieving and we're all at different stages of the grief process and we're coming together and they say sometimes tragedy and uh, distress brings communities together. Well, this is certainly a community that is pulling together and I think Inishowen has united particularly well with uh, the defective Brock's issue. I think that um, our government must see that there is life beyond Dublin. This would never have been allowed to happen in Dublin. Um, I believe that our government is going to see sense and realise that this is not a political issue. This is certainly a humanitarian issue. I mean, the right to safe shelter has to be high up on the agenda. Donegal is a county that is dependent on tourism, farming and fishing. Fishing is dead in the water. Farming is nearly a futile industry for people to make a decent living out, so we're left with our tourism. And where are people going to stay? The investment in the wild Atlantic way has been wasted if we haven't got accommodation for people. Remember, hotels are crumbling, schools are crumbling, libraries are crum crumbling, public buildings are crumbling, but I do believe that Homes are where the pivotal of everything revolves up around. And if we do not have safe homes, I don't know where our society is going. And I find it absolutely shocking that our government can't see the real issues at stake here. Uh, the mental health services in Inishowen are already busting at seams. CAMS has waiting lists of over a year for young people. Um, what you're talking about here is the aftermath of MICA is going to be huge if it's not resolved quickly. I'm really concerned about our students. At the end of this year, we had a number of families were just finding out that their houses had to be demolished. This has happened over the summer. They have been looking for rental accommodation. Some have been successful, others have not. I dread Monday morning as we return to school because I know I'm going to be looking at my register to make sure that these students are back. I cannot imagine what it's going to be like for some of our Leaving Cert students who are going to be studying for a Leaving Cert in a mobile home. Some of them are going to be studying from their sheds, refurbished into makeshift home homes. Some have large families. I cannot imagine what it's going to be like for them to study for a leaving cert with younger siblings running around inside of a mobile home in Donegal weather. It's going to be shocking. In 2016, Michael Ring uh, developed the Pubble Deprivation Index and he can tell you that Inishowen is one of the most deprived areas in the whole of Ireland, apart from Aranmore Island. And what that means is our schools, there's two secondary schools, all the secondary schools in the whole of the peninsula actually receive JESH funding. They also receive school completion funding, which means we are totally disadvantaged. Our students are economically disadvantaged, but they're also geographically disadvantaged. No public funding, no JESH funding, no school completion funding is going to provide equality of education for these students. And they are so on the back foot to begin with. And now this is the communities that MICA is really shattered. I don't know what kind of supports are going to be needed. I don't know what our guidance counsellors within our schools are going to be faced with when September comes. And I certainly do not know how schools are going to get the resources that they need to provide equality for these students who are totally stressed and distressed. 
I spoke to one yesterday and she said, look, I'm not really worried about my leaving cert. I'm more worried about having a place to live in. And she was very serious about that. My message in general would be for MICA families to huddle together. We find strength in the power of people. Let's hope that the people in power will find the strength to do the right thing. And I hope that the greater community and the greater world will see that there's a great need to support us in our plight. This is a decade later for many of us and we do need your help, we need your support and for every minister to pull in together and see how can you actually really support all of these families because there's much more support needed than just the bricks and mortar that is regularly talked about.